I'm Linda von Tilburg for Biz News. Zanana Morrison is a seasoned leadership facilitator, and she was brought in when the opposition political parties gathered in Kempton Park to try to find an agreement on a coalition pact to challenge the ruling ANC in South Africa. And I'm so happy that she's joining me in the Biz News studio. Hi, Zanana. Welcome to Biz News. Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity to have a conversation. I really appreciate it. Well, we know you as an anchor, but today I'm interested in the other hat that you're wearing, you know, this hat of a leadership facilitator and a moderator. Tell us about Zanella Morrison and this role that you have. Well, Linda, you know, I've got over 20, probably 20 to 25 years of experience in the corporate world. Um, And for a better part of that, I have kept the hat of leadership development and leadership facilitation. I used to work for one of the best leadership uh, schools. It actually was the Ericsson Institute in Sweden. And that's where I started uh, my framework around developing leaders um, and shaping them for a pipeline of leadership that we would need in the future. Uh, And I've kept myself in corporate working in various uh, environments. I've worked in consulting for Accenture. Um, I recently uh, also finished probably one of my biggest stints as the director for marketing at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. So I'm a real hyphenate. I walk in and my job is to say, what is the impact that I need to make? How much of a time frame do I have? And I've done that. I can't say that I necessarily have been the greatest leader myself even though I I probably have done leadership development because it's an ongoing journey of learning. But I can say that today, the leadership tools that are required to lead have fundamentally changed from what we've known and what we implemented 10, 15, 20 years ago. There is such a deep authenticity, humanity, and a, a really unpacking of the person so that their performance and how they show up inspires others to do the same and works towards a horizon that we can't even imagine today. So it's really such a difficult, different, complex, only because uh, what it requires is, is the person to surrender themselves to doing what they are called to do. Very different, very exciting times for leaders. Well, how did you become involved in this negotiations for this um, opposition leaders pack? You know, I think it's all thanks to William Gomete, Professor William Gomete. He's seen me at work. He knows that um, I facilitated work with a number of senior executive teams. I am what you call a team cohesion and performance coach. So I come in and just like a coach would for a soccer team, my job is to look at how the team is playing together in order for them to become a high performance. And and he's been very uh, creative about the voices and the people that he's exposed to the co- to the coalition. And, and they said so themselves that one of the things that they love the most is how he's brought in these different competencies and skills to be able to help them along this journey. So... um. What did you find? What techniques did you use? Because you've been successful. You know, the very first thing that we have to do, or the, one of the first things that I do when I work with a team is I get them to understand their own personal stories. Because in any room of leaders, people bring their stories with them, but they're often not cognizant of what their story is. And I do that in various ways. And one of the interesting ways um, that has really been, I think I can pull up from this particular team is that every single person, it doesn't matter where you are, there was a time in your life when you knew there was a calling on you, especially as a political leader, there had to be something that said to you, this is the work that you are meant to do. It doesn't happen by mistake. Many of us, our lives don't happen by mistake. So to go back and to tap into that calling and then to go back, this is part of um, Otto Sharma's work when he says that you need to deconstruct who you are as a person. Go back to the to the right the formation of of the person that we see today, and then pull out the values that are so important to you in the work that you are doing. Those values are what then are influencing, inspiring you, and you need to look at them and see how they are still serving you to shape and deliver for the next generation, for your children and for your children's children. So I work with the deconstruction and really working with helping them to look at what they're coming to the table with from a heart perspective, from a will perspective, um, as well as from a mind perspective. And that's that's really the work that we gravitate and we move up from and down into and then back up again to clarify how you are contributing to the horizon. Well, I've witnessed something similar that happened during the negotiations at the very same place in Kempton Park for South Africa's new constitution. And the characters there were so far removed. I mean, so far removed. But there were people like Nelson Mandela. There were people like Sarah Ramaphosa, like Rolf Mayer. There were characters that 
gel together. Did you see any of that kind of larger than life characters sort of giving themselves and saying, okay, this is more than me, the individual? Even if you even if you listen actually to um, the press uh, conference before, and that came before the actual workshop, for me already I picked up a a call for citizenry, which basically says, you know, we're here to serve the citizen, but serving the citizen as in not owning the job, but how do we play our part for the citizen to own the change that they want to see? And so I absolutely saw a shift from self from 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 from, from those uh, conversations a shift into what is it that we are called to do to change society, not by our might uh, and not by our own ownership, but by moving ownership to the people that are experiencing governance in the country. And, and I hope that, I, you know, that, I, that I've managed to just speak to one thing that I found quite interesting. And, 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 and absolutely, there, are, there will always be those who lead ahead in terms of commitment, ambition um, for the country. And then there are those who will follow. But Linda, I think one of the things that we have to be very uh, careful of is is to is to also think that we are bringing people together who are fundamentally um, under the illusion that they are all different. You know, one of the work that we absolutely have to do is the work of actually calling out the illusions because of social media, because of the news, because of Twitter. There's an illusion that we are constantly at odds with one another, that we constantly are fighting with one another. But if you actually did the work, there's so much more that we have in common in terms of what we want to do for the country than what we have that's different. So the work that needs to be done by all of us is to sometimes step away from the illusion of division and, and look at the fringes, look at those people who aren't speaking loudly and because oftentimes they're only about 10%, they only represent 10% of the population. You know, what else is there that's actually working? How do we start to change the narrative of how we speak and how we engage? Because I, I'm so sure, I'm convinced that there's more that holds us together in terms of what we want to see better than that which divides us. So, so how do we engage all these people who say, I'm not interested in voting, that makes absolutely no difference. Um, how do you, because this is also part of your work, how do you again believe leaders? Because I think that's the problem in South Africa. Nobody believes leaders anymore. How do you get people to actually go and vote? And, and, and again, it's, it's, it's if we do the work, if we continue to do the work of demonstrating the positives, demonstrating unity, demonstrating the admitting when we were wrong and demonstrating our own authenticity to what is right, when we can also step down from the ego position and be open to allowing the rightful people to stand there to represent, I think the biggest challenge we have is that we put leaders on pedestals and therefore leaders think that they are working towards standing on pedestals. And that's really not true leadership. I, I did a little bit of, uh, I did a piece of work at the uh, the Dutu Foundation, uh, talking to young Africans across the continent as part of the Dutu Fellowship. What was so interesting for me, working with young people as well, is we were at the Dutu Foundation, and his work was every bit way. But I come from the Dutu era, and when he was doing his work, I don't think for a minute did he ever reflect the, the that he would be the person we revere today. He was just doing what he was called to do. So, so we are in an environment and in a society that is waiting for accolades, for positions, for shine. We, 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 we look at Instagram. We look. At, it's really about your profile, how many followers you have, you know. But where is the substance of the work? So we need to learn the humility of stepping back, as Mandela had, and and the natural leaders will choose themselves. But we need a leadership that knows how to support without necessarily being at the forefront. And that is going to be the biggest challenge that we have. Is it about me versus about what is required of me right now? And I need to do just that. And the future will take care of it. The future decides who becomes Nelson Mandela. The future decides who becomes Desmond Tutu. It's not today where the decision is made. Well, it's inter interesting that you mentioned the stepping back from leadership because that's with the DA, which is the biggest party in this co co coalition, and actually did. They did step away from the leadership. Were you surprised by that? You know, I, I think for me, my role is not to necessarily um, choose or, or, or reflect on each individual's uh, behavior or, or position. And I'd like not to reflect on on the political parties that are in, that are not, that are. My job is to say, how are we going to work with those who are on board? Because if you're not on board, we can't do anything. If you're on board, we can work. How do we start to work with those who are on board, appreciating, I, I appreciate 
every p- person's position because unfortunately it is their position and fortunately it is their position. Even to win over any other person who's not yet perhaps fully in will require others. It's not me, it's not Professor um, Gomede. It is the others who are going to have to reach out and pull their brothers and sisters into believing into in, in, in the bigger vision or that which we are being called to do for South Africa. So it's really about how do we harness the collective power uh, for the greater good, irrespective of our starting position. Um, while you're a business audience and you also work with a business audience, um, what advice would you have for two partners that might have fallen out in the business? I'm talking about business partners. Or when there's a hostile takeover on the table, what advice would you have? How should you approach this leadership that you were talking about, this getting together and putting differences aside? How should a business approach this? You know, again, um, for me, I'm, I'm privileged enough to be at a time where I understand that these are all journeys. And I, I work on the journey, you know, from the beginning. And the journey evolves. And it is really up to the senior leadership. The CEO has to buy into the concept of collectively building a high-performing team. Um, and when the, the main leader buys into that, he or she brings with them a patience, a commitment, a love and appreciation for each person's position at any given time and, and and opens themselves to the evolution of the entirety of the team. So when there are fallouts, one is able to, to have the patience to step back in that particular relationship and to work towards bringing people along with ultimately for what's good for them. And, and, and the work that you know we do and we facilitate a group uh, or when I do an facilitator group, is working towards ensuring that at first base, we all come in one with an open mind and working towards what is an open mind. And one has to redevelop the open mind all the time. It gets easier when one starts to embody it permanently. And then also about working with uh, your, your, your own internal ability to, to have the heart to continue to work with somebody. Um, the heart, we call it empathy. Uh, we, th- we call it authentically showing up. But how do we help somebody to 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 be comfortable enough to express themselves? And these are post-COVID days, right? Authenticity all of a sudden is okay. Um, humanity and, and really, and, and the opposite is no longer okay. And then of course, it's the will to persevere. If people have fallen apart, is to be willing to take the ride if it is what is good for the business. And knowing when to say it's no longer good for the business. So so how do I answer it? It's a journey. There are elements to look at that you take with you, but it is an ongoing process at every single um, point of the journey as you go along as an executive team. Do you find that they, that executives or um, CEOs are more open for, I won't call it, I don't know if I should call it soft skills, but these skills that you're talking about now, instead of just the numbers I've got to be the leader, sort of more an alpha male kind of way to look at business. Yeah, you know, and I don't say alpha male. We know a lot of alpha females who, yeah, yeah. and that's, and, uh, and we know authentic, there are incredibly authentic uh, male CEOs. And that's my lovely work when I, when I, when I interview and I talk to CEOs. And, and, and a lot of them are not in media, the ones who are authentically driving a business with care. Um, And we assume that leadership is those gregarious, uh, you can never see enough of them on LinkedIn and on on magazines kind of leadership. Uh, And and we think that's actually leadership. And I've I've managed to speak to to CEOs that a lot of people never get the chance to speak to who have demonstrated proper authenticity, proper care, um, proper engagement uh, of staff, proper selection. So I am highly impressed with with a lot of the leaders that I that I just believe don't get seen because uh, the media is not looking for that you know the the the, the news articles and, and the interviews you have to speak in a particular way you have to look in a particular way. so we are very superficial I believe oftentimes on, on the external because we, we we're serving a fast consuming uh, public but when we slow down I think that there are a whole lot of really uh, great authentic leaders that people experience that we don't get the chance uh, to see because we are fed a certain type of uh, narrative and, and, and that's where the alpha female or the alpha male uh, probably tends to take more dominance. So interesting, Zanilla Morrison. Thank you so much for speaking to us. 
Thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity. 